So now we're going to end our day on a very fast note. In the next 60 minutes, you're going to hear from 11 speakers, each with exactly 20 slides. Every 15 seconds, the slides are going to automatically change, so get comfortable. Our chair, Dr. Chris Tucker, is going to take you on a fascinating ride. We hope it's going to set the stage for lots of conversation for our welcome reception. Chris, take it away. Thanks, John. This is actually all you're going to see of me. Um, does everyone have their program? In the program are the names uh, and affiliations of our next uh, set of speakers, 11. Um, John gave you the format. Here's what I'd like to ask of you. Who, who here has uh, never experienced lightning talks before? Everyone's done this. That's okay, a couple of you haven't. So I liken this to a tight wire act. Um, we are asking, this is all on auto advance, um, and uh, there will likely be a stumble here or there, knock on wood, not trying to jinx you. Um, uh, but we will give everybody a hearty, friendly, all in the family round of applause, uh, even uh, if, if there's a stumble here or there, and then we move on to the next one. Um, it's a real challenge for everybody to take all their thoughts and shove them into 20 slides, auto advancing every 15 seconds. And the notion here is that it's uh, getting lots of concepts that we could never possibly have all those sessions co to cover, uh, get them into your head, and to allow you to talk with all of these uh, great speakers with great ideas at the reception afterwards. Um, so anyways, I'm going to uh, invite up our first speaker, Dr. Sean Ahern. Everyone else, you will have to get to know uh, from the program. And uh, here we go. Thank you, Chris. Good afternoon. My name's Sean Ahern, and I'm from Hunter College. I'll be talking about the Cool Roof Project, uh, as well as the solar map that we've created uh, over these last so many years. Um, the project lead was Tria Case, Department of, uh, and the funding was from Department of Energy. In 2011, we created the first solar map for New York City, modeled one million buildings. In 2014 through 16, we've been updating that for the entire state of New York with new calibration procedures, as well as a few other widgets. Uh, LiDAR has been critical to this effort, um, and so we've actually used LiDAR in three parts of New York State so far. Uh, one is, of course, the five boroughs. We also have Suffolk County and Westchester. Um, and we have modeled two and a half million buildings uh, so that for any of those buildings, you can get the solar potential. Um, for all the other buildings in New York State, um, you can draw a polygon on the rooftop and get the solar potential that way. Um, but the other process is automated thanks to the LIDAR, which gives us very detailed information on each and every rooftop um, in the area. This is a one-day look. We're modeling every square meter, every waking day, light day. Um, and this is just a nice little animation just to give you a sense. This is the Upper West Side, for those of you who know New York. And one of the things that we did is we have an algorithm which finds the usable roof area for each of these two and a half million roofs. Uh, so that's one of the unique things about uh, our processes. Here's the calibration procedure. Uh, we have the LiDAR data on the left. That's using the, the ArcGIS uh, to create shading. On the right, we've got PV whites, watts to look at potential. Um, and then we have DayMet satellite to get local meteorologic conditions. This is what the state map looks like, nycsolarmap.com. You can go to it and check it out. Um, and this gives you the sweep of, of sort of the whole state. If we type in an address, we can get the individual information for a single building. And here's one on Park Avenue. It tells you the cost of the installation, the size of the installation, the return on investment, and you can actually hit a button and get a quote from a set of installers. A couple other things we did, we also have um, a grid-ready uh, application so that you know how accessible your building is to a grid so that you can you know, toss up some energy to the grid. Um, a spin-off of this project was a cool roof uh, application that we worked on. And um, in this application, um, people don't always think about it, but LiDAR is an active sensor, and so we can actually get reflectance. 
Uh, the beauty of that in an urban environment is that that reflectance, um, because it's active, we don't have shadows. Um, so what we're going to do is we're going to use the LiDAR uh, for reflection as well as the solar insulation, which we already, already calculated for the solar map. Um, key aspects of looking at the solar radiation input are, of course, trees are really important. Um, urban landscapes are very complex. And so here's an example of what that LiDAR intensity looks like. And we're going to take the LiDAR intensity and we're going to combine that with the solar insulation to come up with those roofs which we can cool. Um, and you know, you're literally taking these darker, usually darker roofs, um, and you're whitening those roofs to reduce the radiation uh, in the city. And there's a nice example of this. OK, so here's the solar radiation. Boom. Here's the absorbed radiation, solar radiation, which is a combination uh, S times 1 minus R. Um, and we are looking further into this, so we're doing more research on this. Okay, so here's the actual cool roof map and what it looks like. So those roofs, um, which are more on the red side, are amenable to cooling techniques. Um, and the next slide will show what that looks like. And this is a full application. Um, so it's, you know, it's, it's just a, 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 a web, app, web app, basically. And here's what we're doing um, to cool these roofs that we've identified. So basically, we can find of the one million roofs in New York City, we can find those which uh, can be cooled, which will reduce the um, heat effect in the urban environment. And I think I'm done. Thank you very much. Hello, everyone. Uh, I'm Anthony Bavacqua. I'm with uh, Montclair's Clean Energy and Anal Analytics Center. I also work for oh, work for the uh, NJDP Bureau of Energy and Sustainability, and I'm a former photovoltaic designer with NRG Home Solar. So today, I'm just going to talk a little bit about my dissertation research, where I'm looking at the spatial economics of clean of photovoltaics in New Jersey. So this first slide here, we're going to be looking at the, um, just a real quick outline of what we'll be talking about. I'll give an introduction to the new CSAC Center, talk about energy in New Jersey, give a quick background of, uh, it is lightning, all right. So uh, the uh, Montclair CSAC is a new center. We're really excited to get going and ramp up our research operations in New Jersey. These are some of our topics, and today we'll be talking about solar voltaics. Is a quick profile of the energy in New Jersey. When looking, about, looking into New Jersey, we have to remember that it's a part of a larger energy system, the PJM ISO. Um, also, that uh, some stricter air regulations in the past have driven away our coal and driven us to more uh, emission efficient natural gas and cheaper natural gas. Solar voltaics, this one I'm glad that I ran out of time on because it's real simple. We have the energy hitting the wafer, ex exciting those electrons. Some of the limitations of the status quo solar design, as you can see the gentleman out there using the sole metric sun eye. As a designer, this is the inputs that I would see a lot of the time where this process of siting ad hoc is very slow and inefficient. So what we're trying to look at is how we can improve that efficiency. These are some of the spatial considerations of solar photovoltaics. Your shading and land use, of course, the built environment, what space you have, and of course the socioeconomic factors. So these are some of the roadblocks that you have with the traditional, as we know in New Jersey, setups for uh, so solar. So it depends on available space, your grid connectivity and hosting capacity, land conservation, available capacity. And of course, uh, as we look move forward, we have new initiatives such as uh, microgrids and having systems that can connect and disconnect from the grid and improve resilience and reliability. So this is our schematic of the solar incentives for uh, looking at community solar that we're looking at. So of course, available space, com policy constraints and incentives based on the electric distribution company territories and bringing in the solar radiation. So innovative technology that we're seeing, tracking of course, module and inverter efficiency increases, Racking and mounting technology, 
I have the repowering up there because some of these newer racking and mounting techniques are allowing us to start siting on landfills that we once weren't able to due to their uh, steep slopes on their southerly facing. So these are some of the, the spatial analysis considerations that we're looking at, where we have the uh, land and habitat conservation, of course, who the off-takers will be. Here's some results of our spatial analysis. We've been using the Microsoft Building Footprint data set, which has got, gotten us some great uh, information at a statewide level. Of course, uh, hosting capacity, and for some of these things, okay, back into the fun stuff. Remote sensing, we've been using a LiDAR point cloud from some of the USGS and NOAA systems to get a municipality-wide analysis at once. So here we have the dig a digital surface model from LiDAR, Atlantic City. Uh, from this, we can get some really interesting results without having to go into the field. So we can analyze slope analyze shadow analysis, similar to what we've just saw. So this is for Atlantic County. And then from those DSMs, we can also do solar radiation analysis. So these are some of our preliminary findings for larger rooftops in Atlantic City, New Jersey, where you can see the darker red. OK, here's a close-up. Here, the darker reds are the higher radiation values, where the blues are more in the shade more of the time. So this is for one day of the year and the um, units we're looking at is watts per meter squared. So from there, you would then take that and bring in the economic analysis. So once we have this suitability analysis using GIS, remote sensing, we then pull in these economic models, such as the levelized cost of energy, adapting the NREL Crest model for New Jersey, and then looking at, um, at risk. So the, the basic outline of our future steps will be performing LCOE for more systems, uh, doing risk analysis, stakeholder survey, and willingness to participate to understand who will be joining these new incentives. And that's all I had. <laughs> Thank you. So hello, everyone. Uh, I will talk shortly about um, social sustainability bioenergy policy and biofuels based on my master thesis research at the Uni Humboldt University of Berlin. Um, first, we do need to put our efforts on the development of renewable energy technologies, for example, biofuels, um, and also in the development of policies that could help uh, support uh, its use. Um, and these policies make sustainable promises to deliver pro or to promote economic development, but also decarbonize the economy, reducing green greenhouse gases, and also mitigating climate change. But this is quite a complex topic that interacts with um, many uh, sectors, for example, biofuels with an agriculture sector, either from energy crops or for agriculture residues. And uh, what about the social system of sustainability? We talk a lot about ecological, economical uh, factors, but what is actually social sustainability? So I decided to embrace um, this complexity looking at biofuels um, that have been supported by policies all over the world, uh, also due to uh, increasing demand of uh, transportation fuels. And um, <clears throat> then what have different stakeholders been communicating as socially sustainable? And is this different perceived depending on the context or the country? So to answer those questions, I used a combined procedure of content analysis and critical discourse analysis, looking at official documents and, and websites from three stakeholders group, government, the private sector, and civil society in Brazil and Germany. And what I found out is that we do have many social uh, topics related to sustainability, also pretty much related to many of the SDGs, as we all know. Uh, but it's quite different uh, in each country. For example, in Brazil, almost all stakeholder groups approach those uh, topics. But uh, for instance, uh, the government uh, stakeholders really lack on approaching from some 
topics, for example, education and training or indigenous people and traditional communities, uh, land tenure issues or political participation, which I called uh, the gaps in the political discourses. Uh, whereas in Germany, uh, sustainability is really always related to environmental sustainability. And all those social topics are always related to the production of biofuels in developing countries. And here I come um, from the deviations between North and South, since apparently we are reducing the social system to basic human rights. And which uh, could be, for example, uh, validated through certification schemes or also to social standards from the International Labour Organization. Um, <clears throat> So what I'm talking here is conceptual, but um, if you were committed to uh, the production of uh, renewable technologies based on biomass, uh, we also need policies working together and looking after all these three dimensions of sustainability. And also on social aspects, uh, and considering that uh, in future scenarios we're gonna be still relying on biofuels, maybe from second, third, fourth generations still. So if a country such as Germany doesn't really need to look after indigenous people or land rights, uh, countries, for example, as Brazil, need to look off those topics on policies. Um, so to take action and to, to address those topics, uh, to fulfill these gaps, we need to hear all the stakeholders in, uh, involved in policy making um, so that we can really uh, address shortcomings in policy and I invite you to think uh, about what means social policy, social sustainability in my country in the context where I live, which are the important topics and how can we include these topics in political agendas. So, thank you very much. Hi, I'm Ben Hohen. I'm a research scientist from Lawrence Berkeley National Lab, and I'll talk to you today about the United States Wind Turbine Database, a tool that I hope you either uh, know about already or hopefully will know about more at the end of this presentation. Some people love the turbines. Some people don't. They feel them that they are blight on society. They are, uh, it's been said that the turbines uh, built um, are, are, are living in a hostile environment if you're living with turbines. If you're the FAA, the NOAA or the Defense Department, though, you care about turbines in a different way. They could interact in unfortunate ways with the radar systems. Um, as well, if you're people, you live closer and closer to turbines. We have 60,000 turbines now, and there's 1.6 million people living within five miles of them. And interestingly, if you look on the figure on the right, turbines are getting closer and closer. This growing number of turbines in both size and, and in uh, capacity are um, something that we have not yet well mapped in the United States. This is the figure I mentioned. Turbines are getting closer and closer to homes over time. Well, so if we are going to map these turbines and have a good idea about where they are and have good uh, abilities to research them, we need good quality data. So as turbines excel, accelerate in, in terms of their number and quantity, as we've seen from lower PPA prices, and high demand, uh, we are going to need good data. But yet, despite that, we don't have good sources of data. You'd think we would. There's the FAA. They publish two data sets uh, that exist. But there are points in the FAA turbine data sets that actually don't exist on land. And similarly, we have points that exist on land that are not in the FAA data set. But we also need richer sources of data, not just the total height, but other characteristics of the turbines. The, the Berkeley Lab, where we, ha we are work, and as well the American Wind Energy Association, collects some of these data but didn't release it to the public until recently. The USGS collected a data set through 2014 but stopped updating it. So the Department of Energy came to the Berkeley Lab and said, how do we solve this problem? We've got a lot of practitioners that need this, and we need uh, good ways to uh, understand the um, potential effects of turbines on radar. Let's build a United States wind turbine database. So we started that process, and in the spring of this year, 2018, we released the first data set 
of those turbines. This is the viewer that is available to the public that can access those data. These data are completely available to researchers and the public. And you'll see in the next slide, the data are available to download in multiple formats. Um, as, well, that's not the next slide. The next slide is that we have visually verified every one of these points, which is extremely important because some of the turbines in the FA data set and otherwise are not exactly where they're located. We need to georectify each one of them. As I mentioned, the turbine data set is, has characteristics that are more rich than available through FAA. We have the hub height, rotor diameter, capacity of the turbines, when it was installed, the project name. As I mentioned, the turbine uh, data set are available to download in multiple formats. We are now developing the capability to have API uh, interconnection with the data set in real time. And this allows uh, folks, researchers, to connect with the data. So how many have? 1.1 million hits we've had on the site since we launched in April. We have 80,000 hits happening each month to this data set. And what's surprising is this, this is only uh, constitutes about 3,000 downloads of the data. Most of the users are using that online viewer. Most of those viewers are from the United States, but we have international uh, representation as well in the data set. Roughly 15 to 20 percent come in from other countries. If you're in the United States, though, you're a user that is in general a .com root address. You're the general public, we assume. But the growing number of users are military users, the .gov roots, the .edu roots, which brings up something that was just talked about on the stage now, and developers. If you're a .mil root, six, seven of the eight uh, branches of six of the seven branches of the U.S. Uh, military are represented here as potentially, I mean, as users, as well the Pentagon, the Joint Chiefs of Staff, and the Office of Secretary General. If you're a .edu user, there are, you're the, uh, the highest uh, number of users, 800 users. We're getting about 100 new unique users each month, and those are kind of a who's who in college and universities. Also, K-12 users are beginning to creep in. So I mentioned there are a number of updates. One is the API functionality. We are going to continue to update this data set quarterly with the help of USGS and American Wind Energy Association. We're also going to link it to the US uh, energy information. Um, that's my end of my slide deck. I guess that's it. So thank you. Hello, everyone. I'm Camilia Cantor from USGF. And today I'm going to talk about the downside of energy access. We're all used to seeing and hearing about deforestation, pollution, wildlife loss, hazards, and disasters as directly or indirectly caused by human excessive hunger for more food and energy. As said by President Carter, our decision, and that should be the next slide, <laughs> our decision to, uh, to deal with energy is going to impact the future of, of our nation. So, do you remember Cute Wally? It was created 10 years ago to criticize consumerism, waste management, human environmental impact, obesity, global catastrophic risks. And this is not very far from what we, we see start seeing today. We win and we lose in life. Heat, a form of energy that can be transferred from one object to another, can be created as well at the expense of the loss of other forms of energy. One such example is Bakaton Community, whose experience offers a dire example of how more heat from energy can lead to loss of more valuable forms of energy for local populations. You see here there's been a longitudinal study on this community. Such communities witnessed a loss and shift in culture, health, and overall well-being, movements from soul to intellect represented through the new land values, from collective consciousness to an individual one. Coming from Eastern Europe, I have lived through domestic energy deprivation. While challenging, it helped create an interconnected society, common faith, and by today's standards, shared sustainability. Lack of social, social media brought people together in meaningful ways, and that connectivity, however, today has been replaced by, by media. As a result, connections through a screen replace the in-person contact, leads to unrealistic, distorted views of other people's lives, opens the door to unreliable information and creates a domino effect on its sharing and use. The OECD has looked at computer use among 15-year-olds across 31 nations. And what they found is not, it's quite sobering. We're moving from scarce energy to too much and irresponsible usage. And the amount of energy has negative impact on health, mood changes, increases in body weight, endocrine disruptions, sleep deprivation, 
and increase cancer risk and lower immunity. All these, these things are, are impacted, uh, impacting today's society. And still, more data is spurring. ML and AI are going to increase even more our hunger for processing power. Moving to the cloud is no less than turning off your light bulbs and going to your neighbors and turning on theirs to do your work. We need to start thinking of how to handle digital landfills, how to handle ethics. We need to think about how to handle our core systems and how to embed ethics into those. Um, everything happens in time and space. It's been 50 years since the Battle of Michigan and Columbia University's location in New York, a media hub, and next to Harlem, a black mecca, was representative of the positive way social interaction can lead to meaningful connections and conversations and sustain social movements held by media and promoted by it. However, today, faced with confusing media messages, media tropes, and bots, people in laudable causes have little ability to face a system and sustain longer movements. Therefore, what can we do? Uh, to change the world, we need to start unplugging. I've been watching everybody here during the conferences, like many of you had computers and cell phones and so on. I'm really glad that you put those aside. We need to start thinking about unplugging. We need to slow down and reflect. We need to create heat by saving energy. We need to start checking our email once, or maybe twice a day, and read the book even from a Kindle, an iPad, but better not. We need to really think of how human lives have been changed by energy, and we have been reaching that tipping point where we actually have to start adjusting. We need to find an improved human nature balance by rethinking our current use of energy and reflect on that frequent use, especially with our kids. And we need to look into how more computer use uh, it has to lead to more computer efficiency, to use innovation in ML and AI to reduce some of our uh, screen interface. And we need to think about ethics. We also need to run and be wary of manipulation that's been uh, happening through uh, with health from energy. And most importantly, in order to do that, we need to first disconnect in order to reconnect. Thank you. Hello, everyone. It's such a pleasure to be here and an honor. I'm a former AGS employee, so to be in front of Dr. Konarski, my mentor in the council, and all of you, I'm just honored. So thank you. My name is Celine Lawrence, and I'm with Sullivan Solar Power. We are a leading solar and energy storage installation firm in the state of California, and so I'm providing an update on what's going on in that slightly warmer state than here. So just a few days before I was invited, we passed historic legislation in California that commits us to 100% clean energy by 2045. And so there's a lot of roads and partnerships that will get there, but one I'm reporting on today is through a program called Community Choice Aggregation. It's also known as Community Choice Energy. And this photo is actually from San Diego a few weeks ago with our CEO, where they committed to participate in this program. Um, and so before I get into what CCA is all about, I want to remind you of the game that we're all currently playing, right? So most of us get our energy from a utility monopoly. We don't have a choice. It comes from one provider, and they determine the rates. Um, but community choice energy really flips that concept on its head. So it's when a city, a municipality, a county, or a combination of those get together to start procuring and purchasing energy on behalf of their residents. So this is happening all throughout the state of California. They're not necessarily in the uh, transmission and distribution industry. We're still using existing infrastructure, which is usually owned by the investor-owned utility or municipal utility, but it's really at the source. So there's purchasing power here, and it's introducing competition into a traditionally non-competitive energy space. Um, and so this was really made possible um, on the legislative level in California. Uh, so there was two bills um, that really allowed this to take place. One is AB, uh, Assembly Bill 117, which established community choice in California and let this be a viable option. And that was followed shortly thereafter by Senate Bill 790, which established a code of conduct for community choice. It really has its roots at the legislative level. So what are the benefits of CCA? One is in its name, choice, so introducing competition into this space. But also CCAs have the power to purchase more renewables that the investor and utilities just aren't able to provide. 
um, also stable and fair rates. So every CCA that we've looked at in California is able to offer competitive, if not cheaper, rates to their businesses and residents. So it's able to be competitive, if not cheaper, which is important. And I want to give you some examples. Rancho Mirage is a fully operational CCA in California at this very moment. In their first year of existence, they had a 5% savings for customers, 25% higher en uh, renewable energy portfolio, and they generated $1.3 million in revenue in their first year. So this is a key component. Cities and counties and municipalities are not for profit entities. So they can reinvest revenue into the community through different programs. Sonoma, you might remember last year, had some deadly fires. We're having some more again, unfortunately, this year as well. But through their CCA program, which is very long-standing since a few years now, they were able to offer over $17,000 in incentives to rebuild homes, all electric and with solar included. They also include free electric vehicle chargers, additional incentives for rooftop solar, and in Marin County, which also has an operational CCA, they actually use their revenue to provide job training in renewable energy for disadvantaged communities. So what would have been profit for share, shareholders is reinvestment. Invested. Accountability is also important too. You wouldn't want to call your investor-owned utility and ask them to increase their renewable energy portfolio. Good luck with that. But here your elected officials are actually responsible and able to communicate with you on the process. And so I'd be remiss if I didn't mention the geographical context. Uh, at the American Geographical Society, but really what CCAs allow us to do is move towards this microgrid concept that a few people have spoke about already this evening. And some of that revenue from CCAs can be reinvested into building local distributed generation. So eventually we're moving towards more flexible, resilient grids, localized, decentralized grids in our communities, which is really important. So where is community choice today? If you see this map here, those dark green areas are fully operational CCAs. Some are Los Angeles County, Santa Cruz, I mentioned Sonoma and Marin, um, and different phases of exploration throughout the state. So the California Public Utilities Commission determines that in about a month from now, 25% uh, of Californians at the end of this year will be getting their energy from a CCA. And by the mid-2020s, 80% of Californians will. So this is really revolutionary, and it's where we're going. And we have a bold goal to meet 100% renewable energy. We have to get there. Most of you will agree with me on that. And I really believe community choice is the fastest and mo most equitable way for our communities to reach that goal. Thank you. Okay, hello everybody. My name is uh, Standa Martinat. I'm from the Institute of Geonics from the Czech Republic. And uh, as currently, I'm a holder of uh, fellowship at Cardiff University. I have a joint, uh, joint uh, affiliation. The title of my presentation is on uh, biogas in uh, the Czech Republic and in Wales, and it's, if you can, Wales in the UK, and you can see in the structure of my presentation that I will focus on comprising of two energy sectors in the Czech Republic and in uh, the UK, which means that there are quite uh, different uh, directories of uh, biogas uh, developments. This is some kind of scheme of possible biogas inputs and outputs. On the one side, there are wastewater, waste, and agriculture products, and on the other hand, there are, uh, there are those results of digestions as heat, electricity, and energy. These are biogas yields. The most rich are uh, fats, but uh, there are quite a lot of controversies connected to that. Uh, here are some basics about comparison of two countries. The Czech Republic is maybe size of South uh, Carolina. The UK is size of Arizona, for example. Uh, as for number of plants, it's uh, almost the same, but which is not the same is uh, the structure of those biogas stations. While in the Czech Republic, majority of them are connected to farming. In the UK, waste majority is connected to waste management, which means that those directories are completely different. Here are uh, average sizes for biogas plants in both countries. In the Czech Republic, it's uh, much more, those sizes are much more bigger as for uh, farm fed biogas stations, while in the UK is for waste fed. These are uh, the structure of renewables and development uh, between, in the Czech Republic between 2011 and the prediction for 2020. And we can see that uh, in 
even in 2011, it was expected that uh, biogas uh, will dramatically increase. But so we already knew that there would be boom, but the manage, management was very bad. So until today, biogas stations create some 24, 25% of uh, renewable energies in the Czech Republic. And uh, they're really important in the Czech Republic. And here on the next slide will be some results of uh, energy policy in the Czech Republic. On the left up, uh, there is a map of very big uh, solar installations, and this is one of the biggest, 38 megawatts, which is really large and is uh, caused by really misleading energy policy of the Czech Republic. Now, to the UK, uh, while, this is, again, 2011 and 2020, some prediction, and we can see those offshore uh, increases are really enormous, while share of biogas declined to uh, some 5% and not more. So this is really important to see those differences between trajectories of biogas sectors in the UK and the Czech Republic. And this is distribution of agriculture ID plants in the Czech Republic in, uh, in last, let's say, 20 years. And today, there's maybe 500 of those units. And from next slide, we'll see that the distribution is very really heavily connected to agriculture conditions. It means, here it is, that uh, agriculture ID plants are located in average natural conditions with not so good conditions for agriculture, but not so bad conditions for, uh, for operating of biogas stations. This is distribution of uh, agriculture plants, ID plants in the UK. On the right, this is a focus on Wales, which is the only region in the UK which is focusing on uh, waste uh, management. And the majority of uh, uh, electricity is generated uh, from waste. These are two examples of not so good uh, case studies, uh, what could happen with biogas stations. These both are from the Czech Republic. The previous one was uh, one was, uh, which bankrupted although it's, it was located, or it is located some uh, couple of kilometers from Prague, so with a rich material for, to be processed for energy from waste. And this one is, uh, that one, uh, was connected to uh, environmental risk and was uh, connected to uh, flood management. And uh, although it's not so safe to, uh, to cultivate maize, for example, in flooding areas, it was cultivated. So, sorry for such Maybe not so important, but thank you. So this is it, thank you. Um, hello, I'm Elise Mazur, a former AGS intern, and I now work at the World Resources Institute. So at the World Resources Institute, we are mapping energy access in countries that where the majority of their population don't have access to electricity currently. As many of you know, Sustainable Development Goal 7.1 is to ensure access to affordable, reliable, and modern energy to all by 2030. Over 938 million people still don't have access to electricity. That's 14% of the world. There are a lot of great uh, planning tools out there such as the World Bank multi-tier uh, multi framework, which assesses energy demand by how much electricity each household needs, whether it's a light bulb or a fully electrified house. There are also supply uh, planning tools out there, such as IRENA's tool for solar potential. There's also wind potential or existing grids and where there is um, a good place to extend the grid to increase access. The missing part is the combination of demand and supply. And there's also a lack of spatial data to put that on a map. That's where we come in. At the World Resources Institute, we're making Energy Access Explorer. Energy Access Explorer is a platform that provides the data and tools necessary to create a future where everyone can have access to uh, modern, afford affordable, and reliable energy if they want. So the platform has data from demand and supply, as I said. We have demand data sets such as mobile phone ownership, which is a proxy for an ability to pay for electricity. We also have demand um, indicators such as where schools and hospitals are that show these are locations where there could be electricity. 
We have supply data sets for resources such as solar potential, geothermal potential, wind potential, that can be used in conjunction with existing and planned um, power lines, mini grids, and so on. These data sets then go into a multi-criteria analysis. The demand and supply data sets are combined to create indices that show uh, areas of interest and can geographically guide the users to where they, are, um, where they can go. These users can be energy planners uh, who can use it to identify existing grids, where grids can be extended, um, if that's the most efficient method for gaining access for people. Another user group is an off-grid developer, such as PowerGen in Nairobi. They can use the site to identify um, new markets for mini grids or solar home installations on individual households, um, in specifically in East Africa. We also cater towards impact investors who can use the site to identify where they should be putting their money for people who have the potential to access electricity, but they lack the financial ability. When you go into the site, you're faced with this decision of which group you belong to. And this is because we've pre-selected data sets that apply to your interests. And this can help you understand what's going on in your realm of energy access. So when you look in the map, you see the underlying data sets that will go into the multi-criteria analysis. On the left, you see all of the data sets that are currently turned on. And on the right side, you see the legend where you can identify those on the map. If you switch the legend from inputs, which it's currently on, to outputs, you see the four indices that we've created with this data. The first is energy access index. It's created by the combination of where there's demand and where there's supply. Those are the next two indices. The last one is the assistance need index, which is for, those financial, um, for the financial aid. And when you put those on the map, you can see the yellow areas are areas that are high supply and high demand, and dark blue is low supply and low demand. So those yellow areas might be good for mini grids or solar home installations. This is one example from 56 countries we'll eventually have on the site. We're currently in the process of collecting data for all of those countries, and we're trying to do that collaboratively. We're working with partners um, in a bunch of different sectors, government, tech, academia, and finance to collect data that's the newest data, the best data, as well as understand the needs of our users so we can make this uh, platform complementary to the existing planning tools. So let's work together to minimize that gap in energy access. Thank you. So there are many assumptions bound up in the contemporary transition to renewable energies. This project employs critical analysis and spatial thinking to help understand a rapidly emerging framework for solar energy development, community solar. Community solar traditionally refers to small solar projects that are shared by entities to form a community who either own or participate in the development of an array. However, individual program designs can vary widely in ownership, financing, and participation structures. The research questions that guided this project, one, what is actually meant by community in relation to community solar operations? And to what extent do benefits generated from community solar operations accrue within existing place-based communities? Since the first project was developed in 2006, community solar has emerged in 35 states and is predicted to add three gigawatts of new capacity in coming years. However, there's little critical research analyzing how it has been promoted as community serving and where these benefits actually do accrue. The two concepts to frame this research, community, a group of people who interact, share an identity and connection to a specific place. Place associated with a physical space, a location, a landscape or feature. We frame this research under the banner of community energy, which refers to a project initiated by a group of people united by a common geographic location or set of interests in which some or all the benefits are shared by these people. The three models of community solar, the first is utility sponsored, and here the community is actually one of consumers whose spatial relationship is defined by a function of the utility service area. And we have defined this as a diffuse community. The second model within community solar is special purpose entity. In this model, investors and developers partner with hosts to site the installation. This is partially a place specific notion of community, as well as a partially diffuse community, which is defined by the relationship to the site. 
The non-profit model. Here, projects are owned by non-profit organizations and typically cited at a community-owned location. This is a very good example of a place-specific community. Benefits accrue primarily with owners, hosts, and at project sites. Up to this point and for a recent publication, we've primarily conducted secondary data analysis comprised of 40 academic articles, et cetera, and information from 22 solar developers. Trends that we found is that very few define community solar and even fewer define community in itself. Initial findings detail this, these non-traditional and despatialized notions of community, and it was common to find the promotion with no accompanying evidence of benefits such as job creation. Another key finding is that although promoted as accessible for everyone, community solar is actually oftentimes not economically viable for many socioeconomic groups. This is because utilities can choose customers and oftentimes dictate who can buy into their programs. One of the only pieces of critical research came from Cadmus Group who argued that community solar often has proven restrictive to those consumers it should logically be serving. Groups with the least access tend to be low to moderate income customers and particularly renters. In our research, uh, we have developed the term community washing, which can be seen through here, seen here through the example of uh, a firm named Community Energy Solar. They promote the idea of community, however, in reality, they only offer utility-grade solar. Just because you're a community solar array doesn't, doesn't mean you can't find your soulmate. We even discovered a community solar matchmaking website linking <laughs> developers, communities, and subscribers on the internet. Because the definition of community has not been adequately defined in relation to community solar developments, our contention is that the concept of community is in a lot of circumstances being misappropriated to what we have called community washing. There's also not enough evidence to actually show how community solar generates benefits to communities beyond economic savings for individuals, investors, businesses, or developers, and not enough evidence to support job creation or improvements to community spaces such as brownfield sites. Based on our critical research into this issue, we recommend that in the future there be more focus on encouraging progressive public and private agreements, such as the virtual power plant seen here, which can help increase access and equity in the community solar market. We also encourage progressive models of governance and policy framework to support community solar and other community-based energy initiatives, such as storage sharing, which is being piloted here in Western Australia. This week, we've been out in the field visiting sites with a local solar developer which is helping inform our future project goals that include conducting comparative research, contrasting policies and empirical outcomes between the Empire State here and the Potato State, where we live and work. Thank, Thank you. you. Good afternoon. My name is Michael Turner. I uh, work with Thermopylae Science and Technology, one of the sponsors for uh, this conference, this fantastic conference on this snowy afternoon. And I'm going to spend the next uh, four minutes, 45 seconds, talking about Google Earth and its applicability to uh, energy planning. I'm going to divide the talk into three pieces. The first is on Google Earth per se. The second is on an open source tangent to the story. And then the balance on some of the use cases for um, energy planning where visualization is important. Probably everyone has used Google Earth at one point or another and knows generally what it is, but it's a 3D um, explorer of the world. It gives you the ability to play helicopter driver and fly around to all of your favorite places here, there, and everywhere with a very realistic view. And Google Earth has changed over the last uh, seven or eight years since it came out originally as a desktop software package, then it became a plug-in to your browser, and now it's really just part of Google Maps, and Google Earth itself has sort of not been supported by Google anymore. Key to Google Earth is three kinds of data. It's the fusion of imagery, terrain, and vector data for things like street names and place names and the like. And there's an ancillary product called Google Earth Enterprise that takes those three different data sets, fuses them together, and builds it into what's called a globe data structure. And that globe contains all the information that enables the 3D flying experience that we all love and play with uh, when we're planning vacations and the like. Um, our company, Thermopylae, uh, has major customers in government, the utility industry, and the military who use Google Earth Enterprise to make their own custom globes for their own uses. 
And because Google has changed and no longer uses Google Earth Enterprise to make Google Earth, it's part of the browser now, uh, they've ended support for this product. And it's no longer available nor supported by Google, which is where open source comes in. And open source is, is a lot more than just um, open availability of source code and collaborative development, it's big business. Lots of these logos, Linux, Android, WordPress, we all know. And uh, Red Hat just was bought by IBM for $34 billion. And so it's really more than free software. It's a new way of developing software. And it's important to have the, the freedom as in free speech, to have the ability to do what you want with the code, not just no cost. And so the happy side of the story is that Google open sourced the code base to Google Earth Enterprise, so it is still alive and well and living in GitHub in a project that's managed by our, by our company and welcomes collaboration. So why would a company take on something like an open source project? It's, it's pretty simple. There are customers out there who want it, who continue to need support for it. And as a business, it's a source of revenue and hopefully uh, profits as well. And how does the monetization work? Essentially, you work collaboratively on the free and open foundation, and you make your money building on top of that foundation by deploying the open software, supporting the open software, or building custom features that particular customers need. And there, there are needs for this um, because there's been this explosion of data, including people and organizations making their own data through drones, through sensors on vehicles, through special flights for infrared, through LIDAR flights. So there's a lot of private data out there as well. And these organizations want to make their own custom globes for their uses using their data, not just the free stuff that's avail been available for Google. They might want to put it behind the firewall or take it offline and into the field uh, for their use there. So back to energy planning. It's inherently place-based. Core questions of where should it go, what's nearby if we put it there, and who's impacted if there's some kind of catastrophe or problem. And you'll see in the next slides, can you spot the Google, visual, the Google Earth visualization? Um, what's nearby uh, utility systems, pipelines, power corridors, et cetera? What happens if there's an oil spill? Can you see this, the spill itself? Can you see a model of the spill and where it's going in context? If you're doing oil exploration, can you see your boreholes or cross sections in the context of the landscape where they were taken? These are the kinds of visualizations. And of course, we've heard a ton about renewable energy today. And again, how do you find the windiest places and the sunniest places and have visualization of these very large tracts of land and what's nearby to build these facilities. So again, we've heard lots of, about smart technology, smart meters, smart grids, and I'd add to it smart visualization, which fuels smart planning and smart energy decision making. Thank you. Hello, I'm Dean Wise. I'm leading a collaborative initiative among the major stakeholders in the wind energy industry. GE, Vestas, Siemens, Gamesa, NextEra, Invenergy, big railroads, big trucking companies. We're trying to improve the supply chain and we need help. So I want to share some geographic insights. There's the wind energy resource, the Saudi Arabia of wind down the center of the US, some real strength in the offshore, and look at the poverty in the southeast. So translation, in the last 15 years, we've actually built a, a wind, uh, wind energy uh, <laughs> capacity. It follows that pattern. Look at Texas, 25% built in Texas, three times bigger than the next biggest states, Iowa, Oklahoma. And again, we see the poverty in the, in the southeast. So uh, I want to tell you a little bit more about Texas. But here's the, here's the ramp up. We're almost at 100 million gigawatts of wind in 15 years. We've doubled in the last five or six years, which is tremendous. But look at the green. The green is, these are quarterly bars. The green is the fourth quarter installation, so we're heavily seasonal. 60, 70% of wind is, is installed in the fourth quarter. Net, net result, today we're at about 6% of electric generation is wind. Coal has is, is actually been surpassed now by natural gas, which is at 32. Coal used to be 50% only, only five, six years ago. Back to Texas. Four reasons why Texas has gotten so big. Texas wind farms resource in the western North Texas. Number two, second largest state, 28 million people looking for energy, not just oil and gas. 
Number three, they have their own grid. There's the East grid, the West grid, and there's a Texas grid called ERCOT. And to make that work, Texas may put $7 billion into the transmission lines connecting the wind farms into the population areas. 3,600 miles. Big, they think big in Texas no matter what the energy is, and they're getting a good result. Uh, wind towers are getting bigger. Hopefully they won't get as big as the, uh, as the Empire State Building. But the biggest one in blue is really offshore. The two red ones are the typical inshore. We're up to four or 500. Those are two to three megawatts. If the one advantage of those uh, bigger windmills is that you have bigger windswept area, you can now actually be economically feasible in the po poverty areas. And we, there's probably 2,000 2, gigawatts of opportunity if we could get those bigger wind generators into these areas. But guess what? We can't. There's a real logistics problem. Big turbines are bigger, heavier, longer, and they create a huge problem uh, for communities and transporters, uh, not to mention the folks that are selling this stuff to get it into these areas. So, and on top of that, there's no incentive for investment. After a big boom here for the next three years, we're going to go down to only two to three to four megawatts a year after the, the, the tax, the production tax credit, credit goes away. So we got issues here in, in terms of getting through this and then trying to compete with solar. Here's the difference in logistics. That littler one on the left, that's a two, two megawatt, 110 meter rotor, thir three me uh, megawatt on the right, almost twice as many shipments. We got more tower sections. We got st still have three blades, but we're not splitting the blades yet. And we also have uh, the, the, uh, the hubs are heavier and bigger. So we got railroads trying to transport blades over, you know, overlapping and on two, two cars or more. There's lots of these out there. They have to go through certain envelopes in the rail system, so there's circuitous routes. Here's the rail trying to transport towers. This is a width issue. As the towers get bigger and heavier. Uh, but the railroads, in some ways, have it easier. When we start talking about the highways, it's, it gets to be a real challenge. There's more and more permitting, more and more uh, requirements. Those long blades have got to get to these communities. That's Belfast, Maine. All those communities in the southeast, they're not going to be able to handle this stuff. And uh, you better have really good drivers. And the driver shortage today is re really reducing the ability of drivers who can get around a curve like that. I cannot do it. That's actually in Scotland, but it's gonna have, that's, that's the problem. Um, and then and on top of that, we have special, very specialized equipment. That's specialized, but the tower equipment, it doesn't even have a truck. They actually bolt the tower sections onto each end of 15 to 18 uh, axle trucks. It's called a schnabel machine. There's only a couple hundred schnabel machines out there. Go buy some schnabels and help us out. Uh, but get out of the way of this. Uh, this is how this stuff is moving. This is not gonna happen. It, really, it looks really cool, but there's not economic feasibility to start moving by, by, air, by a balloon. So what's next? Well, we're going to have a problem on the onshore wind development. I told you the reasons. So we're, the next phase is offshore. Today, the US only has uh, five turbines off of Rhode Island. But you can get all the stuff on a ship. If you have your factories uh, on, at port areas, get it on the ship. They can smooth sail everywhere. Guess where they're going to go? New Bedford. It used to be the whaling capital where they go hunt for whales. Now it's going to be the capital that goes delivers the whales into places like this. That's a 175 turbine wind farm uh, in the uh, Irish Sea. We're going to see one in, uh, called Cape Wind with that many and more, 600, 800 gigawatt, um, megawatt, excuse me, and then New York, New York State's working on a 600 megawatt as well. Thank you. All right, I am the last one up, so I know you, I'm the only thing standing between you and booze. So uh, I'm, I'm going to finish this up by talking about the future. Uh, this is Geo 2050 after all, so specifically I want to talk to you guys about how X, Y, Z, and T, so the, the where and when, are going to be fundamental to the future of energy and energy policy around the world. So i got to start with one kind of core fundamental statement to get out of the way. Despite what you may have seen on Twitter, the Earth is actually not flat, it turns out. That's kind of an important thing. You heard Director Cardillo talking about some of the complexities uh, th that the Earth's shape actually has. But fundamentally, keep in the back of your mind throughout this presentation that the Earth is not flat. So what does that have to do with energy or the future of energy or the future of energy policy? Well, as was, has been highlighted a couple times on the stage today, energy has everything to do with the world that we live in. It's fundamentally locational. So a lot of the core questions that relate to energy and energy policy are core geo-int, geospatial intelligence questions. Where? When? Right? And to, to address a lot of those questions, 
geospatial data has been a big part of, uh, of policy across the board. So this is, should, should not be a shock to anybody, but that data, for the most part, in its current existence has been relatively flat. So we, we've gotten the where piece of it, lat latitude and longitude, um, but that's what we've been focused on right now. So production, transmission of energy have been big drivers in analysis of this type of content. So we have big databases that are out there that highlight where energy is being produced. Uh, we've done a lot of work to identify the lat latitude and longitude of the, the centers of the types of people who need to consume that energy. And we've been working on figuring out how you move, move that energy in between those places. So as we get to today, what, one of the cool things that we're starting to see is we're starting to see a lot of analytics that are driven by uh, this geospatial data and looking f to assess these needs, right? So we see a bunch of new commercial companies that are popping up. Uh, a lot of them are applying geo in into this space and they're uh, focusing on the energy market as a, a kind of key, a key vertical for them. So in today's world, it's, it's kind of mind blowing to think about, but we have these commercial companies that are coming online every day that are giving us global remote sense data sets at temporal frequencies that we couldn't have thought about before and coupling them with analytics. This is pretty cool and it's pretty powerful too. But for the most part, a lot of that data is still flat in the way that we think about it and the way that we analyze it and the way that we present it. So on a, on a related note, as we move forward, there's a lot more data that is being collected daily. This is one of Director Cardillo's big problems in the intelligence community, and it's true throughout the world. More of it's getting collected, indexed, database-based. In parallel to that, um, as we, as we look back on the last couple of decades, there's been an interesting shift in the types of questions that we're asking in the world. So in the defense intelligence world, we say that we've been kind of transitioning from strategic to track to tactical to urban to human scale type questions. So in that same context, remote sensors are uh, becoming more and more prevalent at the human scale that we deal with in an everyday. And in reality, one of the, the, the true realities that New York provides for us is that human scale truly is 3D. I'm standing here, there are probably people standing above me in this building, and we are unique individuals. So the energy sector, much like the defense and intelligence communities, are all in this same boat where we're starting to want to answer, ask and attempt to answer questions truly at human scale. And in that context, it's no longer sufficient for us to think about uh, ignoring or, or trying to uh, extract out that third dimension in our data sets, and we need to fundamentally acknowledge that Z is a hard requirement in everything that we're doing. So the, the transition from what was X and Y to begin with into X, Y, and Z, and then moving into truly X, Y, Z, and T space, where all of our data models actually support this, is, is fundamental to enabling the precision and the kind of micro-scale analysis that we need moving forward. So Vricon, uh, the company that I work for, this is kind of our core mission. So we, we are uh, driving hard on the commercial side of the world to take the best available data that's out there and be able to generate the highest resolution, most accurate 3D map of the face of the planet as a place to start and a place to drive this conversation about why that Z dimension is critical as we start moving forward. With that, I'm gonna get, hand it to somebody or let you guys go out the door, I don't know which. Well, the uh, Vricon was a nice segue because we have uh, Vricon sponsoring uh, a little beer and wine in a minute. Uh, but I want to say that this is an auspicious beginning to uh, our, our two-day symposium. Uh, and we heard about uh, a lot of things, wind and solar and energy fuels and bioenergy. And we had discussions of China and Africa and energy policy and sustainability. And tomorrow, it's going to be uh, as rich as it was today. We're going to be talking about emerging technologies such as fusion and advanced uh, fission, perhaps some wireless transmission. We're going to hear Alex Halliday, who's the new director of the uh, Earth Institute here, will be uh, speaking to us. We're going to be learning about uh, geospatial technologies from some of the leading experts in the world. And we'll come to realize the social aspects are actually more important than some of the technical aspects, or as I like to put it, 
Uh, energy is a social issue with a technical component rather than the other way around. We will outline some of the environmental costs of energy and some of the tools and resources available to measure and counter some of these effects. And I was just looking, I'm going to Poland in two weeks for the COP24 meeting, and I was just looking and, uh, at my weather report. Uh, in Poland, it's uh, 44, and here it's 25. So I'm not sure if I want to leave here, even though it's 75 in Phoenix right now. But remember, tomorrow, uh, we're going to be changing venues. We will be in the historic Low Library, which is this uh, snowball, uh, which is over here, this dome uh, that uh, is just across the quad. Yeah, directions are in your packet. Tomorrow we're going to be stop, start, starting uh, at precisely 8.30, but you can come earlier. The doors will open at 8, and there's going to be some food here. So please join us now for our welcome reception, sponsored by Vrycon, where we'll be featuring locally brewed beers and some of the best wines of Long Island to get your night started. The welcome reception will take place just through the doors on the left. Thank you for a wonderful first day. Thank you.